All right, we're recording. Let's do it. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome in. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan Bennell, and welcome to the Ryan's Ramble podcast. If you are unfamiliar what exactly you are listening to at this moment, well, basically, this is your one-stop shop for all your sports betting needs here at the Frogs of War on the Frogs of War Network, excuse me. Uh, before we get started, like I said, my name is Ryan Bunnell. Uh, I'm your host throughout this. I've been an associate editor at Frogs of War now. I've been writing a lot of gambling pieces. Those tend to be my favorites, doing some power rankings, soccer coverage, all that jazz. If you've seen my name float around the website, welcome in. Uh, and so basically, yeah, like I said, we're just going to be talking about college football bets eventually in the year, college basketball. But as always, shout out to Frogs of War, Melissa, Jamie, everybody for giving me the opportunity to have this podcast. It's awesome. I love doing it every single week. And I love hearing the comments, seeing, um, I know, shout out AO the Horn Frog 17 in the comments section every week. I love seeing your picks. Um, but before we do get started, this is a gambling podcast. So I do have to give a little disclaimer. This is for entertainment purposes only. Uh, Frogs War is not, we are not promoting gambling by any means. We are not an operator by any means. Uh, sports betting is illegal in the state of Texas. What you do in your free time, what you do with your money is totally up to you. But I am not a financial advisor. We are here to have a good time. And even though I may just, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, routinely or like without even thinking about it, I may say like throw it on this or it's just because we're sports betting. I mean, that's kind of the lingo, the language that is used in it. So if I tell you to hammer a line, though, it really just means I really like the line. Do you have to go out and hammer it? up to you but you know my opinion on what to do but anyway uh before we talk about um this week's picks get into that i always like to go through uh and review last week talk about some things we learned but first let's talk about that oklahoma game a little bit just a little bit <clears throat> lost by 21 was was expected uh in the eyes of vegas we ended as a 13 and a half point underdog which i really really thought tcu could cover it especially based on the history, like the last five seasons that we've played or last five times we've played in Norman, I believe has been decided by an average of like six points, something like that. So pretty close. <clears throat> I thought we could have given them a run for their money. But of course, I was talking with my dad about this. Like, of course, sure, Spencer Rattler's great, yada, yada, but he got benched for a reason, obviously. But of course, like the one week that Lincoln Riley's finally like, nah, screw it, we're going with Caleb, is the one week that, they play TCU. Like, why us, man? Why did we have to feel the wrath of Caleb Williams? He was, he's going to be special. That kid is going to be really, really good. There, everybody had, all the, the experts had such high praises for Spencer Rattler. And now this kid has literally pushed him out of a job. Now, did he necessarily just completely beat him? No. I mean, Rattler, Rattler screwed up time to time. He wasn't really playing up to his expectations. But anyway, back to the game itself. Uh, Caleb Williams, super legit. This is Williams' team now. I think he's taking it over. He's going to be a star for years to come. He will – He. I don't know, maybe too early to say this, but he looks like he's going to do some stuff with his career. I think I could see him in the NFL, first, second-round pick when it's all said and done in college. But anyway, that we didn't have Zach Evans. That, that hurt us a little bit, but it really doesn't matter whenever our defense is giving up 50-plus points. I can't remember the last time where like every single game we've played, I think literally every single game we've played, we've given up 30 points on defense. I could be wrong about that. But just off the top of my head, that sounds right. Because even Tech, we won 52 to 31. So like, ah, oh, dude, that's bad. It's just really bad. I don't even want to think about it. So no Zach Evans hurt us for sure. But Quentin Johnson, man, he is a man amongst boys out there. He had like over 160 yards couple touchdowns, including that one Moss that ended up being a uh, Randy Moss on Sunday or Monday night football on like the, you got Moss segment. QJ was number one on that. So love to see that. Even though we lost, it was still nice to see QJ make that catch. Then he did that little thing with his hand. He basically like called him his son. Like you're down here type. Love seeing that. Love the confidence, even though it was an L three and three is not exactly where you want to be. Uh, this is not where we expected. I know a lot of other Horn Frog fans, myself included, considered this the year, dubbed it the year. It has not been the year. It is the farthest thing from the year. Offensively, honestly, we're really not doing that bad. If it is, and this is without being able to rely on Zach Evans completely per se. I'd say in some there are have been some situations where we've definitely relied on Evans a little bit to pick up the yardage, but in like the grand picture, grand scheme of things, 
we've been doing it without him sometimes. So it's not like he is the end all be all for our offense. I just wish, and I can't really talk shit on it now because Duggan just set a career high in passing yards and passing touchdowns against OU. But outside of that game, the passing game needs to improve. So it, there's just a lot of question mark. There's a lot of adjustments that can be made. We've been dinged with injuries, but I mean, every good team gets dinged with injuries and they overcome shit. That's just it's how it's supposed to be. That's how good teams win football games. And right now, we're not there. So this is a pivotal weekend. I think we got West Virginia. This Saturday, I do not want to be three and four. I do not want to have a losing record. I don't want to lose to a two and four team. I'm sure Gary and the boys feel the same way. Uh, TCU is four and a half point favorites right now. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So stay tuned. I'll give my take on the uh, the Vegas situation for the Horn Frogs and the Mountaineers. All right, but first, before we go into that, and before we go into last week's picks, I always do this uh, to start off the episodes. It's uh, things we learned last week. It's a short little segment. These are things that I kind of took the big picture stuff or some, some small things I noticed in last weekend of college football. Take that, use it to apply it for my future bets, even though this week there are a couple that are just obnoxious, not even really beneficial. I just thought I would point them out because one of them is pretty funny. Just you'll see. Anyway, first up, Cincinnati is so above and beyond the group of five. It is ridiculous. I mean, this isn't a big revelation. But the fact that they just stomped UCF 56 to 21 tells you everything you need to know. They, just put them in the playoffs already. In the season right now, put Cincinnati in the playoffs. This was their second toughest remaining game after that Notre Dame upset. Or actually, no, they were barely favored. So I wouldn't call it an upset. But after that Notre Dame big win, they had UCF and SMU both at home. So now all they have is SMU at home. And I think SMU actually is probably better than UCF this year so that'll be a bit harder of a game but realistically I see Cincinnati winning that game by two touchdowns they are so just so much better than anybody else in the group of five it is ridiculous they're levels ahead I am I part of me wants to see because I know personally if Luke Fickle does take you know that um, USC job or that LSU job now in the offseason that would probably be more beneficial for him personally more money bigger paycheck bigger school, more competition. But the thing is, I would love to see Fickle stay loyal, stay true, keep Cincinnati as one of the top programs. I want them to be competitive when they're in the Big 12. I don't want them to fall from graces like a lot of a lot of programs do once they lose their big coach. So, yeah, we'll see what happens with that. But I think Cincinnati is just ridiculous and a shoe-in to finish undefeated. Also, if you are watching the video version, yes, I have a beer. It is 5 o'clock exactly, so it is okay. <laughs> all right. Anyway, Iowa up next. I actually, in my notes, all I have written out is Iowa? Question um, mark. So if you don't know, they got upset pretty bad. They lost by 17 at home to an unranked Purdue team. And this is the same Purdue team that barely beat Illinois, but I think like 13 to 9. And also lost to a cruddy Minnesota team. Same Minnesota that got upset by Bowling Green, that crazy 30-point outright win. Anyway, that's a whole other story. But Purdue, of all teams, I was kind of surprised. Uh, this is like the first time, I believe, that an, a top-two AP team has lost at home to an unranked opponent since 2014, I want to say. I'm pretty sure. But, yeah, I mean, Purdue? And all power to you, Boilermakers. Good for you. Good win. I mean, they, they're four and two right now, I believe. And they got a ranking. They're top 25 team. I knew Iowa's offense was bad, but holy shit. Uh, they they really could not score to save their life. Even at the end of the game, they had that turnover that really screwed them. So just wow, their offense is so bad. And I mean, their defense, 24 points really isn't like something to be ashamed of. But for Iowa's standards, that was kind of a lot. They gave up nearly 400 yards passing um, against Purdue. And also Purdue's wide receiver, David Bell, just absolutely torched him. 11 receptions, 240 yards, and a pair of touchdowns. Just what a beast. Baller. Anyway, I just thought that was crazy. Iowa seemed to be one of the favorites out of the Big Ten. But as I've said in the past, this Big Ten is without a doubt going to end up as the most entertaining conference in football. Whatever transpires, it's going to be much watch TV at come the end of the season. 
All right, switch it over, though, from Big Ten to the SEC. I've talked about Kentucky, I think, every single week on my Things We Learned segment, but I'm going to talk about them again. Kentucky has got some fight in them, all right? I've talked about them potentially being a dark horse. Sure, they lost 33, what was it, 31 to 13, I think. Yeah, sure, they lost by 18 to Georgia, but guess what? They covered. Good teams win games. Great teams cover spreads, all right? They were never going to win this game. It was Georgia. They covered a 21.5 point spread. And I honestly think that Kentucky played the best against Georgia out of anybody. You can say maybe Clemson, considering it was a 3-3 three to three game other than that 74-yard pick six. But aside from that, Kentucky has actually competed with Georgia better than anybody. It was, Of course, it's always going to be hard to move the ball on Georgia whenever they're giving up like five points per game defensively. But Will Levis is a solid quarterback. Don't sleep on him. I loved – actually, I'll wait to talk about this once we uh, talk about the – actually, no, it's script. The spread of that game was plus 21 and a half. Kentucky was underdogs. And I actually had that on the Ryan's Ramble card last week. And it was kind of like a screw it. Let's do it. Let's roll with the Wildcats pick. And it worked out. They actually were down by – what was it? It was 31 to 6. So they were down by 25. And there was about like less than a minute left. They were driving. They were in scoring range. But then they called a timeout with something like 13 seconds left or seven seconds left just to try and score like a last second touchdown, even though it was pointless. I'll take it. Got us a win. Easy peasy. You know, Vegas had to make a couple calls. Too many people were betting on Georgia. They had to even it out real quick. But, hey, a win's a win. I don't care how it happens. Shout out to Kentucky. Shout out Mr. Stoops for making that timeout. Love it. All right, next thing we learned was even when Texas, and this honestly, I don't think we learned this. This is something we've been known, but it's just prevalent after this weekend. Even when Texas looks good, they find a way to lose. Like I will say, Texas is never back. They aren't back, and they won't be back for a long, long, long time, especially now they're going to the SEC. And I'm never going to hop on any sort of Texas bandwagon. But I will say, with Casey Thompson, Bajon Robinson, they looked pretty damn good, uh, especially after that first quarter of the Oklahoma game. I was like, oh, shit, UT's good. Nope, joke's on me. They always find a way to blow it. They always find a way to lose. Doesn't matter whether it's Tom Herman. Doesn't matter whether it's Steve Sarkeesian at the helm. Texas is going to find a way to choke ball games. They're 4-3 and three right now, and they have a pretty decent shot of losing against Baylor this week on the road. And I really hope they do, because if you remember from the first episode, we're riding on a, a Texas future bet for under eight and a half wins. I need them to go eight and four or worse. That would be awesome. <clears throat> but no, that game against Oklahoma State, they could have won. It was a close game. And then with around two and a half minutes, they literally just let Oklahoma State waltz into the end zone. Like they they stopped playing defense, literally let them score. And the philosophy behind it was that they had a better shot of getting the ball back and trying to score on offense to tie the game rather than making a stop, wasting time, and then getting the ball with like 30 seconds left. So honestly, I get it. I get why they did it, but it just seemed so far-fetched at the time. They basically just let them waltz in and take an eight-point lead. So whatever. But Texas is probably going to beat Kansas, of course, and probably going to beat West Virginia as well. And that'll get them to a bowl game at least. But man, could you imagine if Texas really goes from like four and two to finishing five and seven? Oh, I would love that. I would just love it. Everybody would eat that up on the Twitter sphere. There'd be so many memes. Got to get Senator Colcourse to, to roast Texas again. All right. Anyway, this is the one I was talking about earlier when I was saying this isn't necessarily something we can apply to the bets. It's not valuable information. But I thought it was kind of hilarious. Knoxville, Tennessee is a lawless land. There was people throwing trash. I saw pizza boxes. I saw mustard bottles. I saw, I don't even know. I'm sure there was everything out there on the floor. Any sort of trash that's in the stadium you could think of, it made its way to the field. Um, the fans were going crazy. It was a close game. Ole Miss was up 31-26 um, with less than a minute left. And all this trash and rioting kind of, it caused a 20 minute delay in the game. Imagine I would be so pissed if I was, you know, I'm tired. It's been a long day and there's 50 seconds left. You just want to win the game. 
but then there's a 20 minute delay because some bozos in the student section decide it's going to be a good idea to start a food fight with the Ole Miss bench. No, it, I mean, as funny as it was as a spectator, no, you don't, you don't do that. Okay. Uh, the worst part about it all was Lane Kiffin got hit with a golf ball. Like his foot, he almost got hit in the head, which that could have actually hurt him. Somebody threw a golf ball from the stands. Uh, and Lane Kiffin's response was hilarious. He was like, you know, coach, how are you feeling after the game? He goes, you know, I don't know what I'm more excited for. The fact that we found a way to get out of here with the win or the fact that I didn't get hit with this damn golf ball. So classic Kiffin response, love Kiffin. And he also, on his way out, he was getting booze and he tossed his, his visor up into the crowd as he ran through the locker or the tunnel. That was hilarious. That was his first homecoming to Knoxville since he was their short-term coach back in 09, I believe, as head coach. But yeah, that was that was crazy to see. I, I could not believe that. I could not imagine that ever happening at a TCU game or anything like that. But yeah, Knoxville is lawless. All right, and then last but not least, we talked about this a little bit, so I'll just touch on it a little bit. But Caleb Williams is that dude. We kind of were questioning it. We were leaning towards that. We were he was a player to watch. We were waiting for it. He's there. He's done. He's it's not just a fluke against Texas. He is cold. He is very good at the sport of football. He can put balls in places that quarterbacks need to put balls. I, I mean, I'm just putting it as simple as it is, really. He is fundamentally so talented. He's just so athletic. I I don't know. I'm kind of I don't know. I'm kind of riding him a little bit, but I just don't like Spencer Rattler. I don't know what it is. I really have no legitimate reason why not to like him. I just I just don't. I wish him all the best, though. I would like to see him transfer, and I would like to see him play somewhere else. I, I would love to see that because that would be entertaining. You know, what if Spencer Rattler transfers to another big SEC school or something, comes in as a starter, and puts up a Heisman season? You never know. I mean, look at Jalen Hurts. Did it to, he went to Oklahoma after he got benched, So, and now he's a starter in the NFL. You never know what can happen. That's the beauty of college football, too. But all in all, just wanted to point out that we learned Caleb Williams is indeed that guy. Of course, he had to come out and do it against TCU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> all right, anyway, let's talk about last week's picks. Last thing, actually, second to last thing before we get into uh, our official card. I know that's the moment we've all been waiting for. I'll try to get through these quickly, but stay tuned for the official, official card. All right, last week's picks. We went seven and four, which is pretty good. Not crazy, crazy, but seven and four. It's a winning record, up a few units. And guess what? Up. That's the fifth. <laughs> let me repeat that. The fifth consecutive winning week here at Ryan's Ramble. I don't, how am I doing this exactly? I couldn't tell you. I don't know, but we're winning picks and we're going to keep winning picks and we're going to keep picking them until we lose the picks. Big brain. That was. That was a lot of words at once in my brain. But anyway, I have no idea how I have done it. Not to like toot my own horn, honestly. I'm just kind of riding with the confidence. I'm just, I'm not questioning myself. I'm I'm just going with my gut. What If I have a feeling, if I like the numbers, if I like the trends, I'm riding with it. I just got to do it. That's At this point in the year, I have to trust myself because I have found myself looking at bets, questioning them. And then all of a sudden, I, I'm like, nah, I'll play it safe. I won't do that one. But then it hits. It's like all these gut feeling ones are hitting, and I just got to start riding all my gut feeling, all my gut feeling picks. You got to ride the wave while it's hot, but it could come crashing, burning at any moment. That's 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 what, the beauty of sports betting too. It's a roller coaster. It is truly the definition of an emotional and mental roller coaster. But I love it. I love it. And I'm sure if you're listening, you probably love that feeling too. All right. So that seven and four record last week now brings me to a 49, 38 and two record on the year only two pushes which is kind of surprising at this point but we have a 56.3 percent win percentage mwah, mwah, mwah. chef's kiss chef's kiss chef's kiss i love it i love it i want more of it i want to get to 60 percent. i don't know if that's humanly possible but i'm gonna do it i'm gonna beat all the computers all the systems and we'll be the first full season at 60 percent, just raw authentic wins i'm sure somebody's done it in the past but i gotta hype myself up bro come on Got to give myself some confidence. Got to get the nerves, the blood flowing. Let's get it. All right, before we go into this week's picks, talk about last week. So God bless Kentucky for that timeout. I, I mentioned it earlier in the What We Learned segment, but holy hell, that was a gift from the heavens. That literally is the only reason Kentucky covered the spread, and I'll take it. A win is a win. 
Next up, we had Arkansas first half against Auburn. I was thinking maybe after that disappointing loss to Ole Miss, they would come out in front of Woo Pig Suey crowd and get off to a hot start, but they did the exact opposite. They were down, I think, 14 to three in the first quarter. Not what you want to see is somebody with a first half bet. Excuse me. But yeah, they look sluggish. So that was a bummer on that pick. Uh, I still don't know what to think about Iowa State because I had Kansas State plus six and a half last week. I was pretty confident in that one as a home underdog. So I'm really, I have a lot of question marks with Iowa State still. They, they're only, what is it here? I think they're only, um, I forget what I'm trying to say. Sorry, I'm blanking. But anyway, Iowa State's kind of been inconsistent this year. They definitely haven't lived up to expectations. Can they do so against a Oklahoma State team this weekend? We'll see. That's definitely on the card. So stay tuned for my pick. And the biggest bet of our day last weekend cashed. We had Bama first quarter minus three and a half at old, at Mississippi State. That was free money. Bama after an upset loss. I don't care if they're playing Jesus and the Messiahs. Alabama is going to come out with a vengeance and put points on the board. That was the biggest lock probably of the season. And I'm glad it cashed. Always a good feeling. All right. Last but not least, it was another 3-0 day or 3-0 weekend, you could say, on my tier one picks. We had Alabama first quarter was my favorite one. And then Syracuse plus 14, which almost ended up beating Clemson outright. Would have loved to see that. And then Michigan State with the golden half a point cover at Indiana. I had a Michigan State minus four and a half. They ended up winning by five. Beautiful. I love seeing that. So now let's talk about this week. Enough about last week. It was successful. I could go on and on about the wins and wins, but I know that's not why we're here. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, let's talk this week. So TCU, West Virginia, I'm not going to mm, – yeah, I'm going to make a pick this week, actually. I'm going to make a pick this week. It's going to be the first time – that TCU makes the Ryan's Ramble card. I try to stay away. I feel like I'm repeating myself at this point. I'm like a broken record, but I try to stay away from betting TCU games because there's under underlying bias that I may not even recognize. I don't want to be influenced. I always think we're better than we are. It's just a bad idea. But the over-under is a different story. So this weekend, TCU is set at a minus, we were originally minus five favorites, then we closed to minus four and a half. So we're currently four and a half point favorites, which is about where I thought we would be against a two and four West Virginia team. And I think we have a good shot at covering the spread of four and a half, but there's plenty of, of opportunity for TCU to do it with the way our offense has been playing. But the thing is, because of the history of this game, I'm nervous to make a play on the spread. There's been a lot of dramatics, a lot of close games in this. So I wouldn't put a too big of a play on any TCU spread, but the over under is set at 56 and a half. And ironically, after TCU's defense has just given up everything after their offense has been able to put up at like around 30 points a game, I'm ironically going to go with the under. There's not necessarily a major reason, but we'll get into it. They they're actually on my card. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and get into it. Let's start with the tier three picks of my card if you're unfamiliar tier three are my lowest level of confidence so this is going to be for this upcoming weekend in college football tier three i'm going to start out already talked about it a little bit might as well keep going with it so tc west virginia i am taking the under of 56 and a half i know it's not the fun bet life's too short to bet the under everybody wants to root for the points but this is a system play it's also a weather play um and what that means is a system is like you take all these variables, all these uh, factors and everything that match a specific line. And historically, if it wins or loses, I mean, I, it, it's hard to explain, actually. Now, I've never really explained what a system is. That's tough. Like, for example, there's one where, oh, it has to be a conference game. Uh, it has to be a 10 to 15 point spread. It has to be wind of less than 10 miles per hour. And it has to be a team coming off a loss, like all of those factors, like if that is the line and that's the situation, then it'll have like a 60% win percentage over the years. Like there are systems where it's like in certain situations, statistically, you have a better chance because of his history. I don't know, man. It's hard to explain. Give me a break. That is tough. I've never actually thought about that. How to explain that here. Actually, I'm going to Google that real quick while we're, we'll do it together. What is a 
I feel bad. I mean, I've been using these and I can't really explain them. But it's like, if you use them, you know what they are. It's just so weird to explain. So it says, sports betting systems are sets of events that when combined for a particular game, for a particular sport, represent a profitable betting scenario. Since sports betting involves humans, there is no deterministic edge to the house or the gambler. Systems supposedly allow the gambler to have an edge or an advantage. So in the grand scheme of things, the house is always going to win. But yes, these systems do give you a slight advantage because, like I said, historically, it's just like, you know, just like a judge is going to look back at former court cases to, you know, kind of compare and contrast with the, the current case and make a correct ruling. Same thing with sports betting. I mean, you look at these old scenarios, the past trials, tribulations, see how they worked out, see what the record was, and you apply it to these games. So this is a system play. It, since 2005, that's 16 years, games with winds of at least 13 miles per hour have a 599 and 462 record, which is a 56% win percentage, which is in the green. And TCU is currently projected to have 15 mile per hour wins this weekend. Will it be like a huge super duper major factor? No. Will it have an effect? Absolutely. I really like the under. Um, West Virginia's defense has been hard to pinpoint, though. They held OU to 16 points. Granted, that was Spencer Rattler's OU. But yet they gave up 45 to Baylor last week. So I hardly know what to think of them. I know one thing is for sure is their defense is not as good as it was last year. They had the number one in the Big 12 defense. Not there anymore. But give me TCU. Damn, I already noticed. I've already been going on for like 20 minutes. I got to get to these picks. All right. Oh, deep breath, deep breath. Next up, we got UCLA minus one versus Oregon. I think the Bruins are going to get the upset win here. And you may be wondering, oh, well, that's the number 10 team in the country, Ryan. Like, why would you pick against them? Like, they should definitely be favorited. That's exactly why I'm picking against them. Oregon, there's no shot that the number 10 team in the nation should not be favorited against an unranked team who has a loss to a group of five opponent. There's just no situation where they should actually be favorited, but they are. And that, that should tell you all you need to know. Um, Vegas wants you to think that Oregon at plus money is a good thing. It's not. It's really a bad sign. Vegas knows more than we do, no matter what you think. Uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson is about to spoil any crumble, any chance of playoff hopes that the Ducks had left. CJ Verdell is out. I'm pretty sure he's out for the season, actually. That's going to play a factor. And if that may also play a part in the line being in favor of UCLA. But I, I don't care. This is still... If Vegas has UCLA favorited against the top 10 team, it, it's literally an upset central. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. So take UCLA minus one. Add that to my tier three card. And also, this is a similar situation last week where we had... I chose Utah. Um, to beat Arizona State, even though Arizona State was a top 20 team. They were undefeated. But Utah, for some reason, was favored in that game. And I was like, "That's something's not right there. It's sa same exact type of situation. It is a trap game. They're walking into an upset. And Rose Bowl Stadium is not an easy place to play either. Chip Kelly's not an easy coach to coach against. So I like the Bruins a lot, actually, this weekend. I maybe should have put him in Tier 2. All right, anyway, Tier 3. Continuing, we're going with... Pittsburgh, first half, keyword first half spread, not the full game spread, but I'm going Pittsburgh minus one and a half for the first half versus Clemson at home. I really, really think that Pittsburgh has a chance to beat Clemson, and there's a reason they're favorited. As always, there's a reason they are favorited. I trust the first half line more simply because Clemson is such a well-coached, well-disciplined, been there, done that team that even – they're never out of it. They truly are never out of it, and unless it's like a 20-plus point blowout, which I would never see happening in the Davo Sweeney era, especially against Pittsburgh. But Clemson is 0-6 against the spread this season. I think if they cover the spread, they're going to win the game. A three-point spread really isn't much. Uh, I don't know how to feel. Pittsburgh, they're 5-1. and one. They got a top 25 ranking. I was very, very impressed with their 28-7 to win at Virginia Tech last week. I personally had picked the Hokies at plus five. That was a bad pick, I guess. I was trusting in Lane Stadium a little bit too much, but this Pittsburgh offense is revitalized. They used to be such a slow defensive team. They're putting up like 50-plus points a game. They're crazy. 
And Clemson, meanwhile, their offense is just abysmal, like so embarrassingly bad for Clemson standards. Right now, they're ranked 128th in yards per play, and that's out of like 130. So 129th in rushing offense, bad. And then they're just 92nd in passing offense with DJ, former Heisman contender, DJ Ulele. There's really, there's no excuse for that as Clemson. It's abysmal. I can't believe what we've seen transpire from them this season. They are still four and two. I mean, they're not like crazy down and out in the gutter, but are they out of the playoffs? Yes. And Pittsburgh wants to solidify that. So I like Pitt in the first half, open up strong in a big game in front of a home crowd. I like that a lot. All right, now last up, to close out my Tier 3 picks, I'm going with LSU at Ole Miss. Give me the under of 77. Another under on the card, another boring pick, I know. But if you remember from my Ole Miss Alabama pick, I am against 80 point over unders as fun as it is to watch shootouts in like 100 point games like that texas ou game it's annoying as hell when you're trying to bet on it i just i hate seeing over unders be like 70 to 85 i'm just like dude what are you what am i supposed to do with that bro like that that is so many points to expect and so many so much can go wrong but i mean you could say the same thing too with small unders but i am just not a fan of it at all so this is a protest. I'm taking the under. I'm protesting these ridiculous totals. I hate it. There's no really other reason than that. We somehow hit on our last protest on the Ole Miss game. Hopefully we can hit another protest. So give me the LSU Ole Miss under 77. Oh, God. Landshark is so good. I don't know if I'm allowed to like give a promo, but Landshark is that's where it's at. All right, anyway, UMass plus 35 and a half is going to start out my tier two picks. This is my medium level of confidence picks. Not my favorite, but I like them a little bit more than tier three. And I'm going with UMass plus 35 and a half on the road at Florida State. This is a huge, huge, huge spread. I typically try and stay away from this big of spreads. But I like the Minutemen this year for some reason. I don't know why. I picked him a few weeks ago to cover against Boston College. Or no, it was Eastern Michigan, excuse me. And they did so. They covered against Eastern Michigan. It was like a 21-point spread, something like that. Fast forward a few weeks later, they're coming off their first win since 2019. Good for you, UMass. I was so happy to see that. Snapping the nation's longest losing streak with a 27-13 to win over UConn. And holy hell, UConn is so bad. Like, I, I don't even know. I can't put into words how bad they are. They look like they just don't even want to play football. They, they're just waiting to watch their basketball team play or something. Who actually, I'm pretty sure they're in the AP Top 25 for the preseason. It's been a while since they've been up there. So anyway, enough about, we don't need to talk about basketball yet. But uh, yeah, part of me wants to throw a little small play on UMass to win this game. Could you imagine? I mean, that we've already seen a 30-point underdog win outright. And if anybody was going to lose a game where they were favored by 35 or more, it would be Florida State. Uh, I don't care that Florida State just upset UNC. UNC is overrated. As there's, They have not lived up to any preseason expectations yet again with Sam Howell. But – Regardless of that win, I don't think Florida State is good enough to beat any team in the country by 35 points or more. Sure, they may win by 21, 28. I just don't see this big of a blowout happening, especially because UMass is riding the wave off their first win. I'm sure, you know, based on just the reaction too, of because the, they rushed the field and everything, the players were celebrating the locker room. Like you could tell, at least culture wise, UMass still has that football culture. Whereas teams like UConn, it's a wasteland. It's literally just dead. Nobody wants to be there. It, it's it, it's sad almost. But UMass, they came alive after that win. And I'm hoping we see some of that spirit translate this weekend when they take on the Seminoles. So round that out. Give me UMass plus 35.5. Big boy spread. I like it. Next up, we're going to the ACC. Give me – I have a lot, actually, of underdogs I've just noticed. But I'm going with Boston College – Plus six at Louisville. I think both of these teams are about dead even. 
in the ACC, like in comparison to where they stand with the rest of the teams, pretty even, I would say. BC might even be a tad bit better. I've said it before. This is not the BC team from like 2010, whenever they were going 0-12 and, and whatnot. But both teams here are coming off back-to-back -back losses. Both teams are going to want to bounce back. I think this is going to be a dogfight. This is going to be a really close game all the way through. Very similar to that Boston College Missouri game that went to overtime a few weeks back. I think we could see another one just like that. And honestly, Missouri might be a tad bit better than Louisville, and Boston College won that game. So Boston College is capable of winning this game outright, but plus six, I really like that to keep it close because Louisville has kind of been a little seesaw inconsistent. They're harder to pin. But I really love another big reason is golden matchup here. If we're talking personnel, we got the top 15 passing, a top 15 passing offense for Boston College going up against the 128th ranked passing defense. That's what you love to see. That's going to cover you a spread. So give me BC plus six on the road at Louisville. Next up, I'm taking another road team and I'm going to go with NC State. Minus three and a half at Miami, Florida. Now, I don't really care about the semantics for this game. I will fade Miami every opportunity I get at this point. Sure, they did cover a seven and a half point spread against overrated UNC last week. whoop de doo I don't care. Their, their season has been so just bad. There's, there's no other word to put it. They were expected to maybe win 10, 11 games compete for the ACC title, even be like right outside that playoff conversation. <clears throat> nope. They're two and four right now. And I, I actually, let's see. We're again, we're going to Google this together. Miami football schedule. Let's see who else they got left. So the guy NC state, I don't see them. They're two and four. Let's go through it together. NC state L give me this. So that's two and five Pittsburgh on the road. L that's two and six Georgia tech. They'll probably win Miami. Probably win Virginia. I honestly could see Miami missing a bowl game. I like legitimately, they're two and four right now. I see them losing to NC State and Pittsburgh without a doubt. And I, I could see them losing to Virginia Tech or Florida State on the road, even in like a fluke game. I don't know. I, I am completely down on Miami. Been a very unexpected season. But yet at the same time, even though it's unexpected in comparison to their preseason expectations. This is the most typical Miami bullshit ever. Like, this is exactly the kind of choke job flop you would expect from them. They're, they're basically the West Coast, or not West Coast, whew, the East Coast, Texas. I mean, Texas is, oh, we're back. Miami says the same thing. Miami's too busy focusing on that, that hype, that program culture, BS. Everybody was buying into it, myself included, in the preseason. And it's just phony. It's just so phony. They're so undisciplined. I could never mind. I don't need to talk about them. But NC State, though, they're a top 25 team for a reason. They just had a big 33 to 7 win over a Boston College team I was just hyping up. So, and Miami, on the other hand, has not beat a single Power Five opponent all year. They're two and four, and their only two wins have come against App State, which they won by like two. And then they beat CCSU, which is like, Connecticut Central State, I don't know, some school you would literally never hear of unless you're betting bottom tier college basketball, which I will probably be doing at some point. Uh, but yeah, anyway, give me NC State on the road, three and a half. That's a pretty small, small spread for this one. NC State is top 25 for a reason. Miami is two and four for a reason. Take the Wolfpack. All right, next up, I'm riding the wave here. Give me UTSA minus six at Louisiana Tech. Now, I'm not going to be one of those psychos that says UT San Antonio. No, it is UTSA, and they are America's favorite team right now, or at least majority of Texans. I don't care. I have no beef with UTSA whatsoever as a TCU guy. I hope I see them go undefeated. I hope they somehow make like a New Year's Six Bowl, somehow beat a Power Five team. I want to see them do everything. I really do. They're a perfect 7-0 right now. They got their first top 25 ranking in program history, which is even crazier to think of because their program started in 2012, I believe. So they haven't even had a decade of full seasons. I don't care, again, about the semantics on this one. You, you can look at the numbers. You can screw them however you want. 
this is a trend, and I'm not ignoring this trend. I think UTSA to win by six over a bad Louisiana Tech team. Sure, Louisiana Tech has shown up in their big games, like against SMU. They almost they covered the spread and almost won. But I think there's just something. There's that magic pixie dust at UTSA right now. Six points isn't too much to ask for. I think they can get it done. Give me the Roadrunners. All right. Now, next up. Oh, wow. That was actually it for Tier 2. All right. Uh, we're at 40 minutes already. Got to get through these Tier 1s. So, Tier 1, absolute favorite picks of the day. These are my locks, the hammer picks, whatever you want to call it. First up, this might might be my favorite bet of the day. I honestly couldn't really put a pin on which one is my favorite, but I really do like this one. USC at Notre Dame under 59. Man, what is with me? I'm taking a lot of unders this week. But again, like this might be my favorite of the day or of the weekend. At the time of recording this, 76% of the money is being placed on the under, despite only 56% of the public bets with the under. So that is a sharp indicator. It shows that the big betters, the pros, are siding with the under more so. And I'm also utilizing the Action Network, which is an app where not to like shout them out, but it's what I use to track all my bets and everything. And you can also follow me on there too, if that you know tickles your fancy. But I've been utilizing Action Network's pro projections feature, which has this game projected at 55.4, giving us as the better a 6.2% edge when compared to the current line of 59. Those are numbers I like to hear. Uh, I really like this situation. I think this is going to be a very, very competitive cutthroat game. And if it's anything like that Cincinnati matchup for Notre Dame, it'll be low scoring. So under 59, like it a lot. Slap that in tier one, most confident. All right, next up, Big 12 play. We got Oklahoma State. I'm taking the Cowboys at plus seven at Iowa State. Now, I said Iowa State was one of those teams where they were tough to pin. But Oklahoma State, man, they have been quietly undefeated i have never seen a team just not be talked about whatsoever basically get no respect no conversation in the playoff not even in the big 12 championship race really nobody's really talking about oklahoma state but they're winning football games and they've only been underdogs twice this year but they won both of them outright i mean they're playing good football they're they're playing more defensive football too uh and also all the cowboys focus is going to be on this game they have kansas the following week Woo! do so scary so i i don't know i like this a lot i think people need to start talking about oklahoma state more seven points it's a pretty big spread i know Ames is a tough place to play but this is not the iowa state team we were promised in the preseason brock purdy is a subpar quarterback at best i really really would have personally projected this line closer to say iowa state minus three minus three and a half i understand iowa state being favored in this situation because for some reason the public has loved Iowa State since they've gotten good all of a sudden the past couple of years. So as if I was an odds maker, yeah, I'm playing that to my advantage. Obviously, people are going to want to bet. But man, seven points, it's a pretty big spread. Uh, I'm taking Oklahoma State. Give me the Cowboys. I like this a lot. All right, and then last but not least, to round out this week's card, I'm taking BYU minus four at Washington State. So this spread is actually BYU minus four and a half, but I'm going to be buying half a point from four and a half to bring it down to minus four. A little bit heavier odds, but it's worth it. That little half point safety cushion could go a long way. Washington State right now is in shambles. They just had their co head coach, Nick Rolovich. He just got fired for refusing to get the vaccine where we will not get into that conversation. We will get into the conversation as to how it's going to affect the team. This line has already moved from BYU minus one and a half favorites to BYU minus four and a half favorites. It's a pretty big shift. Odds makers see it. Public is seeing it. I see it. it BYU is the better football team. End of, end of story in this situation too. They are better at, than Washington State. This is a perfect bounce back situation for the Cougars. They have, they've had two straight losses, Baylor and Boise State. And now they're going to want to win. And it's also against a team that's kind of in the dirt right now. They don't have a head coach. They have an interim. Actually, I'm not sure if they have an interim. I didn't even look into that. But regardless, this is not an ideal weekend to be a Washington State football fan. It, this is just not a good situation. 
I like this a lot. Obviously, I wouldn't have liked it a lot if I put it in my tier one. So anyway, to round that out, I'm going to repeat tier one. We got USC at Notre Dame under 59, Oklahoma State plus seven at Iowa State, and BYU buying half a point to minus four at Washington State. That is going to do it for this week's card on Ryan's Ramble. I hope, I hope we can have our sixth straight winning week. I want to go. The sky is the limit. I don't care. I, I, I just want to win. You know, I really, there's no other way to put it. I love winning. I hope you guys love winning too. I like winning too because it's, the, it's also the credibility aspect. You know, like nobody wants to come on here and listen to somebody who's going 10 and 30 every month. You know, like obviously that's not going to do anything. So. I love winning because I like being able to give you guys good advice. I like being able to, you know, give you some lines, some picks maybe you wouldn't have thought of, and vice versa. That's, you know, it's a community. Shout out again, AO the Horn Frog 17 on Frogs of War, always commenting on the podcast. I'm sure I'll see your comment this week. See your card. Always look forward to that. So, yeah, leave a comment. With that being said, let me know what you guys are picking this week, what games you're watching, all that good stuff. Other than I assume, I assume the West Virginia TCU game, you know, so. It's nice to be back in the Carter and finally have a game under the lights. I am excited. Can't wait to be there. I will see y'all at the Carter, and I'll be back again for another Ryan's Ramble next week. Let's hope we have some winners. All right, I'll see y'all then.